So welcome everybody. Thank you for your patience, really. Now we are beginning this day and this session with two fabulous guys, Shane Tomlinson and Dan Callahan. Shane works at the London office. He is in the identity team. He is a front-end developer on Persona. He works on Browser ID. Before working for Mozilla, he has lived in the back of vans, out of backpacks, on friends coaches, in hostels, on snowboards, in club dancings, until he down. But this was before he married to Charlotte. <laughs> Dan comes especially from Minneapolis. He belongs also to the identity team. He is doing a combination of development and developer outreach documentation. He believes in free culture and he is a cap diver and a typography node. So together they present you Persona, a decentralized cross-border and open source authentication system that emphasizes user privacy. This session will cover how you can enable Persona support on your own domain in order to issue your own identity credentials. So please welcome Shane and Dan. So we're going to be telling you briefly the what, why, and how of becoming a Mozilla Persona identity provider. You may be wondering, what, what exactly is Persona? Well, to give you a sense of it, I prepared a very short screencast that is apparently not visible when Firefox is in full screen. So here we've recorded chain logging into four websites. He clicked the sign in button, and he clicked sign in in the pop up, and he's done. Another site, one click, two clicks, and he's done. On a third site, you'll see the same thing two clicks, and he's logged in with any email address that he wants to log in with, and without having to have a password established with these sites he's logging into. It's a very, very quick process. Two clicks, any email address, no per site passwords, and you can be signed in. So that's Persona. Let me get the slides back on the screen. So Persona is, well, that's your vote. Oh, no, it's blown up. I'm so sorry, multi monitor. We intended to mirror, and the mirroring did not work. So, so Persona is Persona is an open source federated identity system, and we're building this on open standards right now. That. Okay, you're recording. We're recording. Okay. <laughs> so even though we're here from Mozilla, this is not about Firefox. The reference implementation of Persona works on all modern browsers on desktop, Android, and iOS. <laughs> we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> So we're going to give another little demo here. It's a little bit, uh, you saw earlier in the first demo what happens if you already have an account. So we're going to go through what happens if you don't have an account. We're going to go sign in to the Times of London here, their crossword puzzle. And we're going to basically a, have a user who doesn't have an account at either Persona or at the Times of London. Um, so what happens is you click the login button and the Persona dialog shows up. And it says the Times uses Persona instead of usernames to log you in. Uh, so please enter your email address. So I'm pretty comfortable entering my email address, so I'm going to do that. And we made up an account, plusdemonid.me. Um, this is already made up at id.me, so it's basically like having an email account somewhere. Click next. And this part here is actually really important. Oh, sorry. So what it said, don't worry, what it said is that it's checking with uh, my email provider. Now what's going on there is the browser is actually going out and it is asking the email provider whether it supports the Persona Identity Provider Protocol. Um, no. Yeah, that's what it said. So it does. Um, so IDME is, is a Persona Identity Provider. That means IDME makes this really easy to log in. Um, Persona lets you use your IDME 
authentication account to sign into the times.co.uk. Um, once you verify with your account there, then you're going to be signed into the times of London. So you see what happens here when we click next again. Now at this point, I've been redirected over to my email provider. Um, I'm out of the, not out of the person of flow, but I'm over at my email provider. This is a site that I already know, I already trust. I've been here many, many times before. I'm comfortable putting in my password here. Um, I enter in my password. Click sign in. We're back at Persona, and what you'll see here is it says the address has been verified. So Persona has actually verified my identity by going directly to my email provider, asking my email provider, hey, is Shane really FossDemitID.me? Does he control that address right now? And I do. <coughs> so the proof is handed back to the Times of London, and I'm signed in. Ah, yes, second. So that was the first run experience. And then the second run experience is I've already got an account. I click the Persona Sign In button. So the browser remembers who I was from the first sign in. Even, you know, I had or I didn't have a Persona account before, but now I do. The browser remembers that, and it shows the one address that I have. I just click Sign In again, and basically Sign In at this point becomes a two-click experience. It's super simple. Done. Thank you, Shane. So identity providers are extremely important. The fact that Shane's email provider, id.me, was able to act as an identity provider and issue him proof of his identity in a way that sites like the Times would understand gave him that really great login experience, that two-click experience. You put sign in on the site, choose your email address, put sign in, and you're done. More than that, turning your own domain into an identity provider gives you fundamental control over your identity online. You can't get locked out of an account on a domain that you own. And because the authentication page that you saw is hosted on that domain, you can actually authenticate yourself however you want. Shane built an identity provider that sends him an SMS whenever he tries to log in. You saw that ID me just ask for a password. Because it's on your domain, because you're the one implementing it, you can really do whatever you want there. It also gives you the ability to protect your privacy online. A fundamental goal of Persona is to ensure that by default, users' privacy is assured on the internet. We'll explain the protocol in just a moment, and when we do, keep your eye out, because the data only goes between the browser and the identity provider, and the browser, and the site the user wants to log into. So if you control the identity provider, and you obviously control where you're going, then the ability to log in isn't contingent on an account in some database halfway around the world in the US. It's not contingent on being connected to some social service. The data goes where you want it to go. So those are pragmatic reasons to consider turning your domain into a persona identity provider, but there are also some, some philosophical reasons. We're here at Boston, we believe in free software. We believe in the mission of Mozilla. And one of the 10 items in the Mozilla Manifesto is that users must be able to shape their own experience on the internet. By becoming an identity provider with your personal name, <coughs> you can self-certify, which means that you're not beholden to the whims of a third party. You're not forced to use your real name. You're not limited to one account. You can be who you want to be, and no one can tell you no, because you control that domain, you control your identity. By supporting Persona, you're supporting open standards and open protocols. We're trying to build something that is close to the future of authentication on the internet. Passwords are going away, but they're getting replaced by closed systems operated by for-profit companies that have a vested interest in tracking and monetizing your every login. The open web deserves better, and while Persona may not be the final solution, we think it's at least a step in the right direction. We hope you'll agree. <coughs> so, now that you know the what Persona is, what an identity provider is, why it's actually important, we're, uh, and you've seen how it works, we're going to actually explain how the protocol works, and we've never actually done this before with three people, so this might be a disaster. 
So we'll have it. Um, we're actually going to ask Jonathan to come up and help us act out the whole protocol here. Um, so basically, where all the data flows. And uh, I'm going to act, say we were just at the times 11, trying to do that sign in dance. Um, I'm going to act as the user that's trying to sign in, because I've got a big Firefox thing. Here's the user, three actors. Jonathan's going to act out ID me. So he's got a very simple job in this whole world. And Dan is going to act out the times crossword. Now what happens here is I was the user and I wanted to go log in to whoop, I wanted to go log in to the Times, right? Um, but the Times doesn't have any password about me. They don't know who I am from anybody. Um, so to to be reasonably assured that I am who I say I am, or to be completely assured that I am who I say I am, um, the Times of London really needs some sort of digital proof, and I have to give them that digital proof. Um, and this digital proof has to be verifiable. So what I do is I make this claim that I am ID.me, which is what it says on this little name tag. And uh, I have to go to my identity provider and ask them for proof, because really, if I'm trying to get an identity from ID.me, ID.me is the only one that can actually generate that proof for me. So I go over, I make this claim, and say, hey, Jonathan, will you actually certify that I am ID.me? And Jonathan, goes, well, yeah, he's got a, this account exists with me already, but uh, Shane's going to have to actually type in his password with me so that I can be assured that he is who he says he is. So I tell him my password. Jonathan's like, fantastic. He is actually FOSDEM at ID.me. He controls this address. So Jonathan actually puts his seal of approval, which is a digital signature, which we're representing with this lock here. He adds it onto my little name tag. <laughs> Thank you. And he gives me back a little digital certificate. Now, this is actually a proof of my identity that I can replicate and hand out to sites all around the web. Um, so what I do is I put this. We're back here. This is put in my browser. I take this, and I go, hey, I can log in with this stuff. Um, so I add a little bit more meta information, and I come over to Dan, and I say, hey, Dan, I finally got the proof that you need to log in. So I go to Dan. Dan's got this thing. And he's got one last thing that he has to do. Um, so I've given him, given him this certificate that says that I am FOSDEM at ID.me, but he has to actually verify that this came from ID.me. Um, he can't take it on face value. This has to be verified. But since this certificate was minted with a uh, public-private key pair using normal, you know, normal um, signing protocols, um, all he has to do, all Dan has to do at the Times of London is go ask ID.me for their public key which he's doing now. <laughs> so he's got the public key, and what he can do, he can actually verify that this public key that he went and got from Jonathan himself actually unlocks this signature. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it does, so I can log in. Uh, the Times of London is assured that I have control of this address, and everybody's happy. But the important thing to note is that um, the Times of London, in this certificate here, never got any more personal information about me than my email address. There's no passwords given to them. Um, and the other important thing is, ID.me never knew who I was trying to sign into, so it's completely separated. ID.me doesn't get to find out who I'm signing into. So that's how the protocol works. Protects your privacy. It's pretty simple, but, but how would you actually build an identity provider? We've totally sold you on this. You, you really want to build an IDP. You really want to get a Mozilla Persona sticker by doing something with Persona intent. <laughs> you have two options. Step one, you can delegate. Just like you may point your MX records on your domain, so your email is handled by Google Apps and FastMail, you don't have to run your own identity provider. You can point to someone else while still being in control by virtue of owning your own domain. That's not a very fun talk, though. So let's talk about actually rolling your own. Let's talk about self-hosting your identity provider, actually building the machinery that you need to build. There's really only one step, only one thing you need to remember. This is the only slide you need to remember in this whole presentation. Read the docs. <laughs> Developer.mozilla.org slash persona has everything that we're going to be telling you today. <laughs> I, did, did I just ruin the photo op? <laughs> 
So if, if all the documentation is there and that's everything you need, why, why are we talking to you? The idea is that we're trying to give you a conceptual grounding in what persona is and how it works. So when you sit down with the documentation, you can actually get going a lot faster and you won't stumble over the conceptual hurdles while you're trying to actually implement persona. Again, the Mozilla developer network, developer.mozilla.org slash persona. Uh, I'll also note that persona is still in development, so the docs are best in the US English locale, but translations are always appreciated. So reviewing the protocol, there were four steps. Shane, when he wanted to log into the Times, had to go, number one, authenticate with his identity provider. Number two, receive a signed digital certificate. Number three, present that to me. And then I, as the Times, had to verify that by requesting ID me's public key. Four steps. But the identity provider is only involved in three of the steps. And clearly, the way that the browser and the Times interact with the identity provider has to be discoverable. It's a federated system. Shane could have walked up with any email address that supported this protocol. So how, how does the Times, how does the browser know where to go and how to do this? Sweet. So you saw there are three parts that the identity provider took part in. Uh, these are the, they have to authenticate users, they have to sign these certificates, and they need a public key. Um, now all three of these bits of information have to be published in public at a, uh, actually all three of these pieces of information have to be published. And once all these three pieces of information are published in what's called a support document, that is basically your domain's advertisement to the entire world that you support the persona um, identity provider protocol. Now these are these are always at the same spot. This file is always the same place. We always look for it at the same place, and that is dot well known slash browser ID. <coughs> now when we are logging into IDME, this is actually IDME's support document with the three bits of information. The public key was truncated just a little bit, so it would fit on this slide. Actually, it was truncated quite a lot, so it would fit on this slide. Um, <coughs> but the other two fields are there: uh, provisioning and authentication. Uh, both absolute URLs to where uh, those pages are located on your site. So publishing that document is all you have to do to declare that your domain can support Persona, but you have to build the authentication and provisioning pages so you can actually functionally support Persona. <laughs> so let's talk about the authentication page. That's the page that you saw IDV present, but it asked for a password on. It was hosted on that domain, it's displayed to the user, if you're running your own identity provider, it's completely under control what you show there. But it needs to know who is trying to authenticate. Because Shane started by saying, I want to log in as Faustin at IDME. And IDME said, well, hey, you have to authenticate first. How did it know that you wanted to log in as Faustin? It knew by invoking the function begin authentication, navigator.id.begin authentication. That takes a callback, and that callback receives a single parameter, the user's email address. Now that your page knows who's trying to authenticate, you can ask them for an appropriate password, send them an SMS, do whatever you want to do. And once you're satisfied that they are who they say they are, once you believe that they are, in fact, Fosdem at id.me, you call complete authentication, navigator.id.complete authentication, set a session cookie, do whatever. When you invoke this function, that's telling the browser, okay, I'm authenticating you. I know who you are. So when you request that signature, I should be able to just sign it straight away. It should just work. Which brings us to the provisioning page, which is where those signatures are actually requested. It starts much the same by calling navigator.id.begin provisioning. But this callback receives two arguments, an email address and a duration. The duration is a hint from the browser how long they want your signature to be valid for. So the browser could say, hey, I'm on a public terminal. I'm at a library, I'm at a cafe. Please only validate to me, please only prove to me that I am who I am for five minutes. Or I could say, I'm on my personal laptop. I would like a signature that's valid for closer to you an entire day. But that's just a hint. You can choose to sign certificates for whatever duration you want, but that's a way for the browser to hint at you where it is, what it needs. But what if, what if you got that page? What if you received that request from the user and you didn't believe that they were who they said they were? This page is never actually shown to the user, it's invisible. It just functions to run logic. So if you get that email address and you decide, well, no, you're, you're not actually that person, 
we can raise a provisioning failure, which will send the user to the authentication page to try again. But if they are that person, you need to request one additional piece of information from them. You need that user's public key. So if you invoke navigator.id.genkeypair, the browser will completely locally generate the correct key pair and return the public key to your callback. Now you have everything you need to actually build that signature. You have who the user is, you have how long that signature needs to be valid for, and you have what public key they want you to sign. You send that to your backend, sign it with your private key, and return to the browser by invoking navigator.id.register certificate with that digital certificate. And you're done. That's all you have to do. Those are the only six functions you need to become an identity provider. So there's four parts to this that we were talking about. One is the support document, which is your advertisement to the world that you support, the persona identity provider protocol. The second thing is the authentication page, where you assign users in. The third thing is the provisioning page, which is where you generate the key pair and the certificate. And the last thing is this signing backend. Um, now, you have to do, did we say why you have to do it on the backend? The signature? So you have to sign these certificates on the backend, because you have to sign it with your private key. And uh, you don't want to publish your private key anywhere, or else anybody can masquerade as you and mint certificates from your domain. Um, so these four things, they seem like they can be quite complex. But for IDME, which is that identity provider that we showed already, um, all of that was taken care of, including the HTML and the front and back ends in about 140 lines of code. Um, we used libraries to do that, obviously, but the core set of logic was actually very tiny. So when you embark on this, there are three things you should really keep in mind. The first is the fundamental trust in this system that lies in SSL. The only way I, at the Times, was able to trust that I really did receive ID.me's public key was that I connected to ID.me over SSL. So your support document, your authentication page, and your provisioning page all have to be backed by a well-trusted SSL certificate. Self-signed things won't work, but generally if Firefox trusted out of the box by default, you'll be fine. The other thing is that the support document is very strictly parsed, because we don't want false positives. Oh, this domain is actually returning a nice 404 page. No, we look for those three keys, we look for well-formed, valid JSON, and we look for the JSON MIME type. So you actually have to return that document as application slash JSON. If you mess any of those up, clients won't believe that your domain is actually an identity provider, which can be a problem because that document is also very aggressively cached. So if you're trying to do this in the wild, and you notice that your domain isn't being recognized, you may have to wait about 30 minutes before any changes or any tweaks will actually take effect. We do have a script in our GitHub repository called Check Primary Support that you can run locally, and we'll do some linting and some sanity checking of your support document. It'll fetch the document over SSL. It'll fetch your authentication provision pages. Make sure those are all retrievable. It'll make sure your authentication pages should be able to do what they're supposed to do. But it won't validate everything. Still, it's a good place to start. Now, Dan was talking a bit about these navigator.id functions. And you might be wondering where these things come from, because if you open up your dev tools and whatever browser you use, you're not going to find them anyway. Uh, we're building this into boot to get -Go right now in Firefox, uh, sorry, Firefox OS, and uh, trying to get it into desktop Firefox by the end of the year. But for all the other browsers, and even Firefox currently, this stuff has to be, this functionality has to be added somehow. And we do this using shims. We have three separate shims, actually. The first one is the one for the provisioning page, I think is what it is. The authentication page. The second one is for the provisioning page. And the third one is for the site that you're trying to sign into. Uh, say the Times of London would have to include include.js to be able to use Persona to authenticate at their site. Um, we hope to roll these into one, but for now, you have to include all three. So, I like, this is actually the most important slide. Persona is still in beta. I don't say that to warn you. I say that to say that at FOSDEM, everyone understands the open source software development model. This is the moment where this community can help shape what Persona looks like. Because once it gets on the standards track, things get much firmer and much more static. 
So we need to do, if we're going to build the right thing together, if you think we're even close to being on the right path, I want to ask you to do one thing. I want to ask you to spend one afternoon this week playing with Persona. Try to turn your personal domain into, into an identity provider. Or try to build a site that accepts Persona credentials for authentication. If you don't have time to do that, go do a crossword puzzle on the times. Log in with Persona and see how it works. Then, tell us about your experience. Because only with your feedback can we build the right thing. So Persona, like I said, may not be the answer for authentication on the internet. But we hope it's a step in the right direction. And we hope you'll help us get there. Any questions? Um, the question that I have is back and back. So does any of those files that you don't uh, might have also be better cross sites um, for better? No, they shouldn't because they're actually. Can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. Do any of the files that are served have to have any course headers? Um, since all the files, actually, no, they're not. Um, they're all run on your domain. So whenever you are seeing the authentication page, you're actually, at that point, on your domain. That's not something that's going right inside of anything else. Um, and we don't make any requests, any XHR requests that would actually require a chords header. So if we make a request to the Persona backend, as it is now, that's done in an mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. a I was kind of intrigued by the comments that you said when you mess something up, you should wait half an hour because you cache so much. Now, I understand the value of caching malformed documents, but I do not understand the value of caching malformed or documents or something that's wrong. So the reason we cache a malformed document is so that we don't flood a domain, say if Gmail, for instance, if a lot of Gmail users are doing this, we don't want to have you know hundreds of thousands of requests out to Gmail. 30 minutes may be a bit long, but, uh, but it's really just a consequence of the fact that you are using our shim right now in most browsers, and we had to draw the line somewhere. We may adjust that down in the future. Uh, So one thing, I forgot to repeat the previous question, and it was why are we caching malformed documents? This question is, wouldn't the fact that the Times went and requested IDB's public key reveal to IDB that a user was signing in? You want to take that? All right. I want to share the mic. I mean, it's, we only have one. We have, to, we, have to, we have to play well with our toys and with others. Um, so the reason that the user's identity is still protected in this case is that it's just an HTTP get. And so you may be able to look at the originating domain to determine that one of your users as the identity provider signed into the times. But you wouldn't necessarily be able to recognize who. Because once I have that certificate, I don't have to do a round trip. And I don't have to request it again. Because that certificate is valid for up to 24 hours. And so subsequent logins, I can just go and present that certificate straight away. And that site, I cached the public key for that domain, it could also be verified without ever talking to the domain. <coughs> so the, uh, the worst case scenario is the very first time you log into a site with Persona, if you're the only user using Persona on that domain, and you're the only user going to a given, uh, like a relying party like the Times, then there may be a correlation possible. But any subsequent logins can happen without that visibility. It's also possible the Times could have requested the key through a proxy, which is in fact what most domains will do because Mozilla offers a verification service. You can just post that certificate to us. We'll go fetch the key and tell you it's all right. So if you trust us, you can use us to mask where your users are coming from. So the answer is there is potentially a correlation, but it's very rare. Are there any further questions? Uh, what about replay attacks? Okay, so uh, replay attacks. They repeat the question. So he asked about replay attacks, and um, so basically we we have this bearer token that we're giving out to uh, reliant parties, right? So you take the certificate, you package some metadata with it, and you hand it off to the reliant parties. 
Um, so what we're doing to prevent replay attacks is, um, one, I have to put, before I package that up and send that assertion off and that token off to the site that I'm trying to sign into, I have to put in which site that I'm trying to sign into in there. And then the assertion itself is only for two minutes. So the, the, uh, where you're logging into, they have to look at the timestamp and go, is this thing generated within the last two minutes? If it's not, then it's out. If it's not meant for me, it's out because it would be somewhat foolhardy to accept one that's uh, neither meant for you or it's out of date. And just to add a little more color to that, we omitted in the signature phase, we only showed Firefox requesting a signature on a claim to an email address. But as I mentioned with the API, the browser also provides a public key of its own that gets authenticated together with the identity. And this whole bundle then gets signed additionally by the browser's private key. And so you can be certain that the bearer, the, or the person that gave you the certificate, really was the person it was issued to you. It looks like we have no more time. But if anybody has questions, you can either come up and, and ask the internet. We're going to be around all day. So we also have stickers. <laughs> Thank you, guys.